Good morning and welcome to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. It is Wednesday, the 23rd, uh, 21st of August. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We hope we find you well. First up this morning, we will be diving into the day's news stories, including the backlash over the latest RSA ad campaign and the rising cost of living for students at 7.15. At 7.35, we're going to be speaking to our dentist, Dr. Amber Shoshan. He's here to talk about all things. Look at those pearly whites. Like, honestly, <laughs> I just look at them all. We're talking about, you know, your anxieties around teeth. If you've got any questions about your dental health, you can WhatsApp us. It's 89 You know anxiety about dentistry? Oh, I'm yeah. actually just embarrassed. Like, I'd be embarrassed going into Amber's being like, hey, uh, yeah, how's it going? I, I know. It's, it's like going to confession, isn't it? It's, it's been six years since my last dentist. That's visit. it. That's it. So we'll be chatting about that in just a little while. We'll also be talking about the Leaving Cert because it is Results yeah. Week. They're coming out on Friday. Were you happy with your results? Have you got anybody waiting on yeah. them? Did they lead them to where you go today? Or have you ever actually been asked what your results were? since you got them all those years ago. Text us 89 6 111 with your memories. You have though. People ask, oh, what are you getting your leaving? They still Do ask. Do they still ask you? I've oh, not once been asked. Never. Really? No. That's because they know. They look at you and they're like, there's no point. It's like 600 points. They're, they're, they're um, <laughs> Alan, what are you getting your leaving? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I got, I, ter- oh, was it ter- I got six passes. That's, well, that's great, that's isn't it? No fail. Yeah, that's six, not really good. Six Ds. It's you passed. I know, I did. I passed, yeah. You passed? Yeah. Yeah, did me no good. I like know? that. I don't think I ever had to say what I got my leave insert for any job I've done. No, absolutely yeah. not. There you go. There you go. All on, it's all on natural <laughs> talent. <laughs> but it's in there now. <laughs> Our boss is going, nope. No, we've got the CV. He said he got six A's. He said he got six A's. He's lying. <laughs> now, there's lots more coming up. It's actually very interesting to see um, what you got in your leaving cert and did it help you in your career or did you ever have to so to say, yeah, there's my results. Sure, Ambrish did, in all fairness. Oh, Ambrish, yeah, he <laughs> went so. to college, yeah, there we go. <laughs> now, also on today's show, there's a roast tomato curry in the kitchen. We've got leopard print on the catwalk. And Phil of Science is going to be giving us the scientific explanation behind making, wait for it, poo. Mm. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> it's two minutes past seven and I said poo. There we go, Derek's in Limerick this morning. How are you getting on, Derek? <laughs> Two minutes past seven. That's an interesting one this morning. Anyway, I'll ahead of our trip to Douala in Tipperary tomorrow for the agriculture show. We've landed down here in West Limerick. Now, it is a drying settle start. Good deal, cloud cover. Then some light showers in across the northern half of the country before we see some heavy rain in from the west later on. That combined with some high August tides may lead to some coastal flooding and overtopping quite a windy day out there as well today. Now, the beautiful touristic uh, town of Foynes in West Limerick is where we're at this morning. Of course, there you'll find the Foynes Flying Boat and Maritime Museum. It's a hub of hive activity dating back to 1939 uh, right through to 1845. So we're going to be uh, following in the footsteps of the likes of John F. Kennedy, Bob Hope, Maureen O'Hara and of course Eleanor Roosevelt. So that's all to come. And of course Foynes is the birthplace of Irish coffee so we may even have a tipple or two. Hello from Limerick. <laughs> Coming up, we'll be getting into today's news stories, including anger over the Road Safety Authority's latest ad campaign. And we'll be speaking to dentist Dr. Ambrish. If you have a question for him, please send us a message on 0896 111 See you in a minute. Welcome back. It's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. The headline there, Israeli arms companies can bid for Irish drones contract. Israeli companies are well positioned to win a €600,000 contract, military sources have said. Ireland has paid more than £8.5 million to Israeli arms manufacturers in the past decade. Greens furious at Fianna Fáil plan to shelve tax on land hoarding, asking if Fianna Fáil was serious about tackling the housing crisis. A senior Green Party source said the decision means the tax might never happen as the front page of the Irish Independent. The examiner leads with girl 12 in hospital after mass gang raid her home. A 12-year-old child remains in a serious condition in hospital with a possible brain bleed after her home was attacked by a gang of up to five mass men in North Cork on Monday night. Parents targeted in budget charm offensive. Free school books will be extended to leaving cert students in the upcoming budget as part of a charm offensive by the coalition. That's the top story on the Daily Mail. The Herald goes with this story. Woman dragged off street in sex attack. A construction worker dragged a woman off a Dublin street and into a park where he sexually assaulted her and threatened to kill her, it's alleged. 
The star leads with 6am sex and strangle attack in City Park. Romanian Marius Lactus is accused of sexual assault in which a woman was allegedly told she would be killed. The Mirror says hunt for trapped bodies. Rescuers were last night clinging to hope there might be survivors in the sunken super yacht tragedy in Sicily. Not for sick kids. Simon Harris announced yesterday how Fine Gael is delivering for families, but this isn't true for kids waiting for scoliosis surgery. That's according to the front page of The Sun. Another story that makes most of the papers this morning is the backlash over a new Road Safety Authority ad campaign. And joining us with that story and everything else is News Talk's Andrea Gilligan and Lorcan Nyan from the Communications Clinic. Uh, morning Hi, to morning. you both. Yeah, Lorcan, this ad is getting quite a lot of backlash. Why? Yeah, look, it, it's, it's not on me to kick a state agency when they're down. The RSA have, uh, have had qu uh, quite quite a poor couple of months mm. and, a, and a tough time. But they've, they've put out a campaign now that basically is saying if you lose your licence, you lose your independence. So it's targeted at young men who'd be worried about losing their independence if they're disqualified for drink or drug driving. And the ad, the basically idea of the ad is that you're a burden on everybody else and you'll have to ask for lifts to training and ask for lifts everywhere. And it's kind of jumping up on the back of your friend as they physically lift you to training or, or, your, or, or a date physically lifts you home. It's been criticised for two central reasons. Number one is that it's, it's seen to be ableist. So if you're not able to drive, if you have epilepsy or if you have a disability that means you cannot drive, that the RSA, the state agency, are telling you, you are a burden on your family. And mm -hmm. people with these conditions will say they already feel like a burden sometimes, even though they shouldn't, mm -hmm. but they do feel like it and therefore the state agency shouldn't be saying it to them. It's also been criticised for a kind of a secondary reason, which is that it's, it's indicative of a mindset in the Road Safety Authority is that they're all about cars, yeah. that they're... In, incredibly car centric they don't think actually about the road network about the public transport network they just think well of course you should be in the car and sure isn't it awful if you're not and the argument would be that the state agency should be thinking wider than that and there's lots of people depending where you live who don't have a license who get on just fine. Mm. And so much so that someone has called said that the RSA should be disbanded, Andrea. Yeah, well, the Green Party TD, uh, Nessa Hurricane, she's one of the, I suppose, one of the politicians who's been quite vocal in, in criticising the, the campaign in recent days. Um, she has actually called for the RSA to be disbanded over it and for the organisation to, to delete the tweet. But she's not the only one. Like, there are many other um, disability advocates um, and activists in recent days who have been, you know, front and centre of actually criticising criticising the campaign, the messaging that, that Lorcan has described um, and, you know, I suppose really just kind of the sentiment that it sends out about the fact that it is seen as sort of being quite ableist to, to people, you know, across mm. the country. So, look, it's an interesting one. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, would feel that losing your licence is losing your independence. I think it's probably the, the issue is kind of around the, the language, um, whether it's the loss of licence, loss of independence versus the idea that you become this burden on somebody if you're no longer driving. But but the whole aim actually of this campaign, and this was carried out by research, I think the RSA did, with younger male drivers in particular, where they wanted to focus on the impact of a disqualification and the impact of not being able to get behind the wheel. And that seems to be the feedback that they got from young male drivers was, you know, how fearful they were of not being able to drive and, and that yeah. loss of licence. So it seems that that's, I suppose, how the, the premise for the ad nearly came about. And, and now, obviously, it's facing calls for it to be deleted. Well, in that, in that research, they also found that it was uh, friends and mothers who were able to slow young men down, that if they said, would you please stop if they're in yeah. the car with them, that's what would slow them down. What We want to know what you make of this, uh, about this ad. If you've seen it, you just saw it, sh showed it there as we were speaking. Um, do you think it's ableist? Do you think that this is just the wrong message to be sending, that we all have to be drivers and that you're a burden if you can't drive? 089 611 -111. And because it is causing a huge amount uh, of controversy in relation to all of that. Mm. Yeah, okay. and look, I, I think that there's a couple of other elements to it straight away. I mean, number one, even in their response to the criticism, the RSA used the term burden again. Um, so I think that does show they're maybe yeah. not quite getting the criticism. But the, the overall idea of the ad, which is, look, young people do care about, young men do care about the independence. Let's talk to that emotional need within them makes sense. But the RSA, in some ways, are in a tough situation because all of these campaigns are going to be less effective when people look at them and they don't then see the enforcement on the roads. Yeah. So you can have all these brilliant campaigns in the world, but if young men are watching them and saying, but I'm not getting stopped at checkpoints, yeah. it's not going to happen. Um, and then also when you look into the figures of it, there was a, if you take Dublin and Dublin, right, there was 4,000 drivers disqualified in Dublin in 2022, I think is the, is the most recent year. So 4,000 disqualified. Only 3% of those actually handed back the licence. 
Right. So within 12 days, you have to hand back the licence. Only 3% mm. did. So these ads aren't going to be that effective if you're not being stopped consistently on the roads to be tested. Because yeah, you're just not going to believe it. That is we are talking about it. And yeah. there would, there's never been as much talk about an RSA ad in, in quite a long period of time as there is yeah. over, like the, over the head of this. Mumba, we're, bodies, we're bodies. About yeah, or when you go back to those, uh, those yeah. ones in the past that were awfully grim, but yeah. they, they were potentially more that effective. Yeah. 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 Uh, another story affecting young people in the papers is the cost of going to college. We were yeah. talking about this off air. I remember when you could go and you had 20 quid in your pocket and that was your <laughs> night out and your taxi <laughs> home and your, your chipper. And I'm not that old, you know? Yeah. Like so. Uh, but this is a particular story, Andrea, that people and students in particular are now skipping meals such yeah. as the increase in just the cost of going to college. Yeah, like the average cost of going to college at the moment for, and it's interesting for students and I think parents probably listen to this, it's about €15,600 a year. That is what it's going to cost you. That's actually up €536 Euro on the same period last year. And if you're thinking of going to college in Dublin, Maynooth, Cork or Tralee, they are among the four most, ex well, sorry, they're, they're among the areas to have experienced the largest increase. Mm. Um, Dublin and Maynooth and Cork, probably unsurprising, among the most expensive. Letterkenny in Donegal, the cheapest place to um, go for third Donegal level. Donegal pride here. Yeah, uh, yeah I was about you know, to say, yeah. do your board culture <laughs> campaign for students. Do the CAO <laughs> campaign there. Donegal and Sligo, I should say, too, in the northwest, <laughs> uh, among the two cheapest places to go to college. But look, it, it's a reflection, really, of, I suppose, um, where Everything. things are at at the yeah. moment, you know, in terms of your rent, your groceries, your entertainment. In inflation is obviously impacting everything. There is a significant jump, but the reality of all of this now means, according to this study from switcher.ie, um, that some students are actually just skipping meals, they're skipping dinners, they're skipping lunches midweek in an effort to try and save this additional money that they're going to need. They are, they are definitely going to need an extra 536 quid by compared to this time last year. But like it is, it's, it's a lot of money. Um, it's a lot of money in terms of your, your yeah. living accommodation, your just your general day-to-day -day expenses. Mm. That's before you head into any big level of entertainment, perhaps gym costs, whatever. Yeah, other gym costs is very, yeah, 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 there for students now, but in like, fairness. You would think around the country, groceries are groceries. Yeah. But there's best value groceries, Sligo, Athlone, Letterkenny, Dundalk and Tralee, but Cork, Maynooth, Dublin and Waterford, 50% more for their weekly shop. People who are there, students who are there are pay, paying, paying more for their weekly shop. Like, groceries are groceries, surely, No. Yeah, it's supposed to supply, supply and supply demand. Supply and I mean, demand. You, you know, if you walked in, there is a big difference, I mean, yeah. when, when, when you're shopping, when you're doing anything um, yeah. around the country. Look, it's a cost of living story, really. It is. I mean, when you look at it, it's talking about students and it's looking at it through the lens of students, but really it's, it costs Everyone. you 15,000 to live to exist. You know, that, that's what we're talking about here because if you look at the housing cost, the entertainment cost, the cost of a point. Um, and like, you know, I remember well myself as well, you know, where you'd kind of get in before 12, you get into the nightclub yeah. for free. Yeah. <laughs> Everything was meticulously yeah. planned. Yeah, you'd make yeah. sure you had the fiver, you the fiver in the pocket to make sure I didn't spend That's it. So you have to have the taxi, taxi on the way back. Right. But those, those days are, are gone. The for, sweaty for shoe fiver. I'm fine with the sweaty yeah. shoe fiver. Hang on. 0896 triple one triple one. Going to college. You've got someone going to college. Just the cost, how it's adding up. Yeah. Are you managing to get a second job because there's travelling and everything that's happening there? Yeah. Uh, with all of that as well, we would love to hear from you again. It's a cost of living story. Now we're going to move on to holidays and people who are working on holidays. What's happening here, Lorcan? Uh, there's one of these stories every once in a while that makes you sit back and say, what are we doing with our lives and <laughs> with our existence? Okay, it was a, a UK study I mean, went into UK workers that says two in five UK workers are continuing to check their emails while they're away and the top earners, so if you're earning over, over 100K sterling, are working three days out of an average seven day holiday. Mm. On top of that, again, there's a significant percentage, up to 40%, mm. who aren't taking their full annual leave. And the most, the common reason cited um, for working while you're away is to reduce the stress, and stress is the word used, for when you get back. Oh, so you stay on top of it for when you get, yeah. the Monday morning when you get the back The unread in. emails. What? The unread the emails. emails. Yeah. So that's what people are, tr are trying to avoid. I mean, there's one thing if you just love your job. You know, if you adore it and you love it and you want to tip back in and you want to have a quick meeting, that's grand. I presume that's a small percentage of people. Everybody else is trying to reduce their stress already post the holiday. You're two days into your seven day holiday yeah. and you're worried about the Monday. We have built our society wrong, yeah. effectively. But it also, feel I think it that. depends on your profession as well. You know, I know a couple of solicitors who who get emails and get calls no matter where they are. And people expect them to be on the whole time. You know, they're not, oh, it's not good and enough small, that you're on you know, holiday. Small in your business way. owners and things like that, there's a yeah. the thing of, well, sure, if I don't answer the phone, they're yeah. going to go elsewhere. Yourself Employees. Work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can 100% see how you would have to check emails, reply, respond to people. Um, or is there an element of just wanting to get away from the kids as well? 
I just wonder, yeah. you know, if yeah. there's a lot of like, this is harder than my actual job. Oh, I see you yeah. now. I'm just going up holiday. to work just in the room. Yeah. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Check in um, oh. emails when you're on holidays doing a little bit of work. Is that something that you feel like you have to do? 089 6 111. We would love to hear from you, as always. Andrea Gilligan will be on News Talk at 12 o'clock today. Thank you so Thanks, much. Guys. And Lorcan, uh, Lorcan Nyan from the Communications Clinic. Thanks, Thanks guys. So Thanks Cheers. for coming in. Uh, now, coming up next, Dr. Ambrose will be here to answer all your questions on oral health. He's also going to be discussing that dreaded Dentist anxiety. See you back here after yeah. the break. Welcome back. Now, recent research reveals that the Tooth Fairy is doing more than just leaving cash under your pillow. The survey says that Tooth Fairy visits are key to teaching oral health habits to children. Joining us now to talk all things dental is Dr. Amber Shortan. Good morning to <laughs> Good you, Dr. Morning. Amber. Hi. And before we start talking about, because we one of the main things we want to talk to you about is anxiety, going uh -huh. to the dentist. But this, uh, this survey is very interesting because I think if you start this, like, oh, the tooth fairy, and we've all, we've all done it, oh, leaving yeah. you some money. But it yeah. does encourage uh, oral health and, and brushing your teeth. Yeah, I mean, it's a good incentive for kids to start young and start early. When, um, like when you incentivize a child to look after their teeth for a reward of some description, be it money or, or his you know, reward, or his or her. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of positives to, it. And, and I think that's where dentistry is going as well. It's positive reaffirmation <clears throat> and positive, um, basically pushing pushing things in the right direction. Yeah, but the tooth fairy is. And the first dentist like, has always been there and kind of yeah, knew, a child's this is traumatic connection. and yeah. I'm going to help you out. Yeah. Yeah, They've yeah, always exactly. kind of known. So like, they are like your head dentist. Yeah, they are. And they're the first dentist that you know, we send out to the public. Yeah. The kids. And like, you know, the you kids. go and look after the kids and then when they're ready, they'll come and see then us. Then come and see us. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the tooth fairy thing, it's, it's a very good way of basically encouraging kids to look after their oral health and, and, and in a very positive spin of things. Yeah. Um, and then parents can then, it's, it's, not an, it's not a fun task to do to get a kid to brush their teeth, but if you can mm. spin it in a positive manner for the child, then of course that helps. And that is always the case, isn't it? Just put it in a positive light, maybe yeah. play a little game around it or yeah, do yeah, something. Yeah. And exactly. if you start young, it obviously helps and yeah. you don't have to go and visit you. But for the people you who do, do have to, you know, yeah, <laughs> you still still one day every six months, What's every, every year, six depending. Months. Yeah, but people but, who have to go to you and some people get very, very anxious about going to yeah. a dentist. Yeah. Why is that? And dental anxiety is a real thing. And it affects a huge population in this country. Um, and there was an article last year uh, by a dentist called Dr. Niall Neeson. And he is a, a guy who specializes in treating very nervous patients. And there are a lot of dentists out there that specialize in treating nervous patients. And that could be, the, the treatment of nervous patients is pretty much the same as any dental visit you're trying to get a patient on board with looking after themselves first. And I think a lot of it is prevention. <clears throat> yeah. A lot of patients end up leaving things go. And I think there have been reports of people being too ashamed to go to the dentist to begin with. Yeah. And when the that comes got so in, bad. Yeah. And then the, the longer you leave that, the more things start deteriorating. And then you almost find yourself being, or rather you feel that you're being judged by the clinician or the dentist. But the reality of it is my colleagues, all the dentists in Ireland are not there to judge you. Um, we are there to help. Yeah. And when there is an issue, we want to try and tackle the issue and the root cause of the problem rather than, right, your teeth are terrible because you're not looking after them. And it's nothing really to do with that. It's all about how can you prevent things rather than mm. now we have all this basically disease that we need to try and treat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dental anxiety is a real thing. It's, it's very it's real. It's very, very real. I see a lot of patients with it. And um, strategies that people can use? Meeting the dentist, looking up the dentist first, looking at their photographs about the practice, inquiring about whether they have um, options like sedation for dentistry. Well, this is the first question. You've been sending in yeah. your questions. Thank you so much. And this viewer says she's terrified of the dentist, but mm. she needs work done. Can she? ask the dentist to put her to sleep you can but can you the reality is you don't need to so there are various degrees of sedation you have gaseous gaseous sedation which is basically nitrous oxide which is yeah. laughing gas right? yeah so that's the that's a sort of the the lower end of things and then it goes up right up to a general anesthetic now to get a general anesthetic firstly your waiting lists are very 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 long 
and then the risks associated with getting a general anesthetic for yes. something that can be done quite routinely in a dental practice, it's way above what needs to be done. So gaseous sedation, nitrous oxide, IV sedation is very, very widely offered in most dental practices in Ireland. Okay. So that is an option. And are and you not, actually asleep or you're you just are, very drowsy? It's conscious sedation. So you are conscious, but you almost pretty much don't remember anything. And I'm, how, how extensive does the dental work have to be to get that? Or can you get that if you're you just getting get your tooth out? You can get that for a filling. You can oh, get right. that. Yeah, people get nit or nitrous or IV sedation for routine fillings if need be. But the way is I like to, to think of it, like that? So this is the thing. So the, the way yeah. I like to think of it is throughout our lifetime, we are more than likely going to need a couple of fillings and more than a couple of fillings. Yeah. I have loads of fillings in my team yeah. and I get fillings, right? So the reality of it is you want to try and get those interventions done as minimally invasive as possible and you don't want to get sedation for every single treatment yeah. you're doing it's yeah. different if you have you know a big amount of work that needs to be done for someone who hasn't That's been it. for you know a good number of years oh, i hope that if you've got huge anxiety talk to your dentist about yeah. it another viewer got in touch they've, they've got two root canals a lot of people have root canals mm -hmm. they've been reading a lot about the danger of root canals i.e bacteria and related health problems yeah. is there any truth in this and would they be better getting a tooth removed the, the short answer is if you can try and save the tooth by means of root canal, definitely save it because with a tooth being removed, there are a lot of other implications. Your jaw bone can shrink, the gums can recede. Uh, and even if you were to get an implant, which is a replacement, a like to like replacement for a missing tooth, that in itself has a lifespan. Everything in dentistry, unfortunately, has a lifespan. Yeah. Right. So if a root canal can last and buy you another 15, 20 years, ideally, then do that before exploring the possibility of an implant. The dangers behind root canals and some of the some of the theories of root canal causes cancer, and that's a big. It can cause cancer. No, no. it does. Uh, this, these are the reports, yeah. right? So if you look at, if you just Google root canals and cancer, there's always a link. If you look, if you Google root canals or rather um, drinking water and cancer, you probably will find yeah. links. Oh, okay. There's no so peer, there's, peer reviewed study in this none, though, is no there? Scientific, none, there's no there's scientific. There's no scientific evidence to suggest that there is yeah. any okay. negative implication of root canal being done. Okay. okay. Speaking point? of keeping your teeth in and trying to do something, this next viewer said she has a broken tooth where her filling has fallen out and she's wondering, is there anything she can do other than to take out the tooth? Yeah, I mean, definitely Get speak to your dentist. Yeah, exactly. Fillings come out because more than likely because there is decay underneath the filling. So basically the filling is getting a bit looser, there's a gap, mm -hmm. filling falls out. So best thing to do, speak to your dentist, explore what the options are, explore whether there's a possibility to refill it or get something like a ceramic restoration which covers the tooth. So the bigger the filling is, the less tooth you have, the less tooth you have, the more stronger materials you will need to actually try and fix okay. that back on. So there are always possibilities. Okay. Uh, here's one thing, a viewer, she grinds her teeth at night, wants to know what causes it, what can she do to stop it? She can't sleep with a mouth guard. Yeah, it's a very common thing that we see tooth is, wear, is it? grinding, yeah, yeah okay. about 30% of the population have. 30% wow. those grind in their teeth at 30%, yeah. Why do we do it? Social anxiety, stress, um, life, work, like all these different causes of... Um, it's amazing basically... that your body's doing yeah. that without you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's, it's psychological stress definitely plays a huge part. Um, often patients come in busy, busy periods of work and they've really clenched. You feel a lot of tightness in your jaw joints, right, yeah. muscles, especially when you wake up in the morning. Uh, some people even doing it during the daytime. When yeah. they're at work, they're really focusing, concentrating on something, and you just kind of see them clenching the teeth. And one of the, the one of the easiest things to actually check is put your hands on your cheeks and just yeah. bite tight, just clench tight. If you feel those muscles popping up, you have basically bodybuilder jaw muscles. So oh you're God. very hyper, hyper. So what can you do? So there's a couple of things you can do. Night guards is one of them. And night guard protects the main, wear, uh, main point of the night guard is it protects the teeth. Yeah. If you can't wear a night guard and you have been advised to wear a night guard, try wearing it during the daytime just to get your mouth accustomed to it first. It's my first okay. sort of line of defense. Then you'll gradually get used to wearing it. The other thing you can do is these are muscles that are basically working. So muscle relaxants, muscle relaxant injections that some people get slightly higher up than the jaw. Like a Botox. Also get into really? The yeah. So bruxism or masseter Botox is called, but you can get into your jaw muscles 
to and relax the And that will relax, that muscle. will stop the grinding. It won't stop it, but it'll reduce the reduce intensity. It. Because you're, it's not as... So you put less not pressure as, yeah, on Yeah, not yeah. as not much pressure. Yeah. No, no, you're no. doing later on today. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Straight away. I, I just can't even grind my teeth. It's like it's yeah, the one thing I, you don't have health no, related. I know, it's amazing. I know. Dr. Amber, thank you so much. You that was welcome. very interesting. Thank this you so morning. much. Really thank you very it. much. Now coming up, boxer Callum Walsh will be here as he gears up for his homecoming fight that's happening in the Tree Arena. Yeah, you don't want to miss it. See you back here very shortly. Now, our next guest is one of Ireland's most prominent up-and-coming fighters with a current record, wait for it, of 11 wins and no losses. Ooh, that's a nice one. Callum, Callum Walsh is trained by the legendary Freddie Roach and backed by UFC president Dana White. So, you know, he's in good and fancy company. Let's take a look at him in action. I feel like I need to like scooch a little bit away just in case <laughs> after watching that, course. you know. Might no, not to ask impressive. any hard questions. Good morning, Callum. How are you doing? Morning, yeah, I'm doing good, yeah. Listen, doing that's good. like that's amazing to, to look at. It's, it's a bit <laughs> scary. It's mad. But let's go back to kind of the start of your career because we're just off the back of the Olympics. The Paralympics are coming up. A huge thing for Ireland's boxers. Uh, you narrowly missed out on going to Tokyo. You were beaten by uh, Aidan Walsh, who went on to win bronze. What was that like in the beginning of your of your career? Was that was that a good thing to make you go, right, I want to go pro? Yeah, you know, the Olympics was always a goal for me, you know, from when I was younger. I always wanted to go and, and represent Ireland, you know, yeah. and represent my country at the Olympics. But, you know, I was I was 18 at the time, you know, I was very young. Um, obviously, I had a lot of wins before that. You know, I won the six Irish titles, a European gold medal. So I had high expectation you know, that I was going to go all the way. Um, but, you know, like they say, everything happens for a reason, you know, and it probably was the... The best thing that happened to me is I did lose that fight, ended up going to America and uh, I'm sitting here talking to you, you know, today, you know, so everything happens for a reason. So I'm not, I don't feel too bad about it. You know, I'm doing, I'm doing okay. Yeah. So it brings inside your head then when you decide to go to America, what were you thinking? Is it all bright lights and shiny or, or what made you make that move? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't even really even know what I was thinking. I, was, I had no intentions of going there and just, just turning pro straight away. I didn't have any ideas of that at all. You know, it was just... The middle of COVID, everything shut down here. You know, there was no gyms open. There was no training really for mm. me. I was just working and, and, and trying to train by myself. And and then I heard that there was gyms open in America. So my plan was to go there and train just for a couple of weeks and, and come back and try to have that upper hand on the people here that, that weren't training, you right. know. So um, then I discovered that actually Ireland was a banned country from travel to the US. So I had to go to Mexico and stay there and try to get in and it was it was a long uh, yeah you had a few attempts trying to get across yeah. the border like you know Donald Trump wouldn't have been too happy with you no yeah, I, know, <laughs> I, I know I nearly had to sneak in yeah well I did sneak in in a way you know I told him I was going there just to, to visit my family and I got I got turned back um twice and then the third time I flew in and and they let me in and that's when I got there now but I was still only planning on staying for a couple of weeks you know yeah and I showed up at Freddie Roach's gym knocked at the door and asked him if I could train and um tell us about Freddie Roach this guy's a, a legend yeah hall of fame trainer Freddie Roach he's had I don't know how many world champions he trained Manny Pacquiao you know he's mm. he, he came back here with Steve Collins you know to Cork yeah and had that fight in Cork when he won the world title um so Freddie Roach has been around a, a long time you know and I went there when I was 15 I went to Los Angeles to the gym to meet Freddie and I took a picture with him and I bought a t-shirt from the gym. So I always knew, you know, if I was going to go back to LA, I would go mm. to Freddie. And that's when I knocked on the door and uh, he made me spar my very first day with one of his pros in there. Wow. And, and what was that done. level jump like? Was it a bit very different to what you were doing here? Because Irish boxing is obviously in pretty mm. good space. So is it much of a jump or are they pretty on a level? You know, I feel like I was, I was okay because I had a big... Uh, amateur career here, you know, I had a lot of experience uh, with fighting, so I feel like I done I done well when I got there. Um, 
and Freddie was happy enough, you know, he told me to come back the next day and uh, that's what I've literally just been doing ever since. So you're a boxer, how does Dana White, the head of the UFC, get in? How, how are you involved with him? Yeah, so after about a year and a half of, of training with Freddie, I made my pro debut with Tom Loeffler. Um, and then that was in December and then in March they were having, they decided to have a St. Patrick's Day show. And then I was the Irish boxer for that. Yeah. Of course. And, uh, of course. And then Tom was working on a deal with Dana to, to put boxing on UFC Fight Pass. Right. Which is where my fights are, yeah. So then, with Dana's history with the Irish fighters, obviously, Tom brought me down there to meet with Dana. And, uh, yeah, me and Dana have been good friends ever since. And he came on board, to, he sponsored me with the Howlerhead Whiskey first. Right. And then him and Freddie have a good relationship too, so they talked and, and Freddie yeah. told him, that I was one of the best fighters that he's ever seen, one of the best up and coming fighters, and that's when Dana decided to come on board 100%. And you also, right, and I can't believe I'm saying this sentence because you and famous people are sort of mixing together, but Mark Zuckerberg's wife has rubbed Vaseline on you. She's a doctor, isn't she? Is she? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, that was, that was very strange. You know, it was, it was uh, I didn't expect, because when I go to a lot of these events, like, I forget that these people see me from Dana, you know, they, yeah. they obviously, are there because of Dana, and, and then they see Dana talking about me, and I forget that they would even know me, you know. And I was actually just waiting for, waiting for my girlfriend in the bathroom, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg yeah, and his and his wife came up to me, and they, it was actually the cut man. He was like, "Oh, she, her dream is to put uh, Vaseline on a fighter." <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> "All right." That's quite a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before they like before they went for the fight, and uh, yeah, she she I was the the only one that was around. <laughs> well, done, Priscilla. The first one. well done, Priscilla Chan, <laughs> rubbing down a fella in front of your fella. Yeah. Sure isn't that lovely. Come yeah, here, you're awesome. going to be fighting um, at the Three Arena. It's your homecoming to Ireland, Friday, the September 20th at the Three Arena. It is a Continental America super uh, welterweight main event. You're fighting against Ronowski. How are you feeling about coming home? Yeah, I'm feeling very good. You know, I've had 11 professional fights all in America. You know, I fought in New York, I fought in Boston, I fought in Los Angeles. And I've been waiting to come home for a long time. You know, I haven't fought back here in four years, you know, and um, a lot of, the big reason I want to fight back here is because my fights are so far away. You know, I've built mm. a big fan base back here. I have a lot of supporters back here. The support is, is unreal, like, and um, a lot of people can't afford it, you know, to get over to these fights, to get to New York and yeah. with jobs and everything, you know, people yeah. don't have time, so. Being able to come back and, and put on a big show here for everybody is is, mm. is going to be unbelievable. And you've just talked about how you're going to replace Anya Sullivan's statue in Cove. Yeah. Is that <laughs> no, the no, plan? Maybe, maybe not replace it. No, yeah. Go beside uh, her. Now that we're on, I won't say that. You'll go beside her in Cove. Right next to her, you yeah. were running with her. You were competitive yeah, against her yeah, last maybe, year in a run. Maybe a bit bigger, maybe a bit taller. <laughs> 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 Are oh, you going home to Cove? Uh, no, unfortunately not. I have oh, to fly back to LA tomorrow. Yeah. Right, well, so you'll be there. back on the 20th. Tickets go on sale at 10 o'clock today via Ticketmaster, your homecoming fight in the Three Arena on September 20th. Callum, thank you so much. Thank you, man. Good morning. Best of luck. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, still to come this morning, we'll be discussing the impact of the Leaving Cert results, the good, the bad and the downright disastrous. Plus a comforting curry in the kitchen. It already smells amazing. And Derek is learning all about flying boats in foins. Happy Tidman. This week on Ireland AM, we've teamed up with Breast Cancer Ireland to give away a his and hers Fitbit and entry to the Very Pink Run every day this week. The 2024 Very Pink Run is back again with an option for participants to take part in either one or all three of our physical Very Pink Run live events. Being held in Dublin on the 31st of August, Kilkenny on the 1st of September or Cork on the 8th of September. You can run, jog or stroll, something for everyone. Every fun-filled step taken as a part of the Very Pink Run is a step closer to saving lives. A fun-filled experience for you and a powerful act for those affected by breast cancer. For more information, visit verypinkrun.ie. For your chance to win, just answer this question. How many colours are in the rainbow? A, 2, B, 7. To enter, call 1550 treble or text WIN to 57199. Best of luck. Now it's time to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. The headline there, Israeli arms companies can bid for Irish drones contract. Israeli companies are well positioned, apparently, to win a 600,000 euro contract, military sources have said. Ireland has paid more than 8.5 million euro to Israeli arms manufacturers in the past decade. 
Greens furious at Fianna Fáil plan to shelve tax on land hoarding, asking if Fianna Fáil was serious about tackling the housing crisis. A senior Green Party source said the decision means the tax might never happen. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The examiner leads with girl 12 in hospital after masked gang raid her home. A 12-year-old child remains in a serious condition in hospital with a possible brain bleed after her home was attacked by a gang of up to five masked men in North Cork on Monday. Parents targeted in budget charm offensive. Free school books will be extended to Leaving Cert students in the upcoming budget as part of a charm offensive by the Coalition, the top story in the Daily Mail. The Herald says woman dragged off street in sex attack. A construction worker dragged a woman off a Dublin street and into a park where he sexually assaulted her and threatened to kill her, it's alleged. Star also leading with 6am sex and strangle attack in City Park. Romanian Marius Lactas is accused of sexual assault in which a woman was allegedly told she would be killed. The Mirror says hunt for trapped bodies. Rescuers were last night clinging to hope there might still be survivors in the sunken super yacht tragedy in Sicily. Not for sick kids. Simon Harris announced yesterday how Fine Gael is delivering for families. But this isn't true for kids waiting for scoliosis surgery. That's according to the front page of The Sun. And lots of texts coming in this morning about a number of topics we were chatting about this morning, including the RSA new ad and uh, disability activists have condemned the ad as ableist and criticised the use of the word burden. And this is if you lose your licence, you're a burden on other people. And they're yeah. sort of saying like, you know, what about the people who don't drive, who have disabilities, yeah. can't drive? Are they a burden on society and on your family as well? And uh, like a lot of you have been getting in touch with us and um, we're getting one here. Looking at the RSA ad, I felt it gave the message that if you are in a position where you do have a licence and your own independence, you should consider the implications on your life and other people's if you lose your licence through drink or drug driving. They tried the other way with those shock ads, which we mm. all remember. And, uh, and the horror sides of accidents and people were saying, oh, that's too much. So it's like, can they win? Can they, can they not? not? Do, yeah. do we think the RSA is... is I thought of... those ads were brilliant. I they still were... with me. Well, yeah, you'd certainly like... remember them yeah. anyway, haven't they? They've never yeah. gone away. Take the your eye off the, the fence. The, and... the, 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 road fence. Yeah, the children that's in that's the garden. Yeah. Oh. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, a message from Jur who simply says, the RSA ad is disgraceful. And then the other side of it, yeah. Derek texts in to say, I have ep epilepsy and I can't drive and I'm in no way offended by this ad. As a road user, I'm offended by bad and dangerous driving by some road users. We need more and stronger ads like this to save lives. So there's the other maybe side of it. The the yeah, side maybe of it you do well, need... Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the number of deaths has been on the rise now for the last few years, so maybe it is time to Absolutely. shock and awe. I think maybe the bigger thing with that was that it was done in a kind of a comic-y tone. Kind of it a funny was very tone about it. People on their back. Yeah, like, like yeah. light music in the background. That maybe that's the not the way to go. That it wasn't hard-hitting, like, who is this actually meant to be for? 0896 triple one triple one. We'd love to hear from you. But uh, interesting though with it was that it was taken, I believe that we were saying earlier on that they did a survey and young men especially said that the loss of their driver's licence yeah. mm. would be a big factor in it, that they would... Cons but like, they conveyed it in a funny way. Yeah, yeah. And it's I not know. funny yeah, if you lose your licence, no, you've lost yeah. it for a very serious, serious reason. Serious reason, yeah. yeah. And now we were also talking about the rising costs of um, uh, to college students. Like mm. everywhere else, there's inflation um, all over the place and college students now are going to be spending hundreds of euro more uh, trying to go to college this year. Kathleen said, I went to college in the 90s and I was often broke. I had no car, entertainment or gym costs. I made my own lunches and I worked my way through college. It's a lifestyle that children have that makes it unaffordable. unaffordable. I still pack lunches for work. I would just like to say in relation to this study, it actually wasn't much about them going out and having a great time and entertainment. No. It was your groceries are costing more. Your Everything rent is costing, is costing more. more. It's costing so much more. It's not like these are going out. It wasn't about the luxury yeah, items. Yeah, buying that even the stuff to make those yeah. packed lunches. Yeah. Yes. You know? yeah. And yeah. especially in Cork and, and Maynooth, Maynooth and, Dub yeah. and Dublin yeah. and places like oh, that. Yeah. yeah, Deirdre's also texting. With regards to the students in college, a lot of them are struggling and trying to hold down a job while they're studying, like many of us did. Unfortunately, this means that they are missing important lectures and tutorials, but some have no option. Shouldn't we be focused on supporting them so they can focus on their studies and get the most yeah. out of college. Yeah. Uh, listen, yeah. we'd love to hear from you as always. If you want to get in touch about any of the topics this morning, please do send us a WhatsApp on 0896111111, especially, sure, most people have an opinion on the next one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. After the break, we have got the lowdown on the leaving cert. Yeah, we discuss how important these exams really are. See you back here in a few minutes. <laughs> Now, more
more than 62,000 students across the country are nervously awaiting their Leaving Cert results this Friday. But is the Leaving Cert the be-all and end-all it's sometimes made out to The be? question that we ask every single year and that people who are far removed from it are like, sure, it's grand. Yeah. But when you're in it, uh, here to discuss is Terry Prone from the Communications Clinic, podcaster Carla Kay and guidance counsellor Donica O'Mahony. Thank you all for being here. It's it's so nice. Come here, Donica. It is all about the anxiety leading up to that day because we know uh, that households are het up right now. Yeah, so we're about 48 hours away from the results. It'll be 10 a.m. Friday morning and candidates will get the results this year on the candidate self-service portal. So uh, pre-COVID, everyone went into school to get the results, but now you have to get them online. So that's gone, the that's nice gone, day of everyone yeah. going in and you get your envelope and the TV camera comes out to yeah. you. It's, it's all really, gone. It's really weird. Yeah. Like a rite of passage is gone from so Irish So now life. you log in yourself uh, and you could be by yourself in the room or bring someone in with you, whatever way you want to do it. But the Candidate Self-Service portal is on examinations.ie. Make sure you're registered. You can go in and check your username and password to make sure it's working now so you don't leave it till Friday morning and you're wondering why I can't log in and get my results. Now, will that have totted up the points for you now that it's all fancy and digital or are you still going to have to do that panicked adding up and, oh, I added up wrong and I didn't get my course and all that sort of That's stuff? That's a great question because you still have to add it up yourself. Okay. So the State Examinations Commission is separate to the CAO. So they'll give you your grades. So you'll only be counting up your best six. Now, if you have someone in the room with you, maybe you're getting a little bit overwhelmed by the whole uh, situation, make sure they know how to count the grades into points, how to convert them, and that you're only counting your best six, even though you might sit seven. Mm -hmm. And you're getting 25 bonus points if you get a H6 or higher in your math. Mm. Okay, and before we move on to like, does this all matter with everyone? <laughs> if someone, the very real possibility for some people that they will not get the course that they had expected, that they wanted to, the points are not what they wanted. What can they do? There are other ways, right? With CEO, with tertiary degrees, with PLC courses, what can people do? What should they be looking at? Yeah, so we were just chatting outside. Simon Harris has done an amazing job in the last couple of years as the higher education minister. And there's so much you can do. As you mentioned, we're in the new tertiary degrees are only out the last year. So there's no CEO points required for them. They're still taking applications. So that means you... What is it? So you start in a PLC college and you finish your degree in a university. Okay. So if you did a PLC and apply to university, there's no guarantee you get that. If you start the tertiary degree, you're guaranteed that progression into university. So it's a brilliant idea. So we have PLCs, tertiary degrees. We still have courses that are unfilled in the CAO. We'll have courses that are unfilled in the UK. They kind of go on like almost like a sale where they don't require those entry requirements anymore. You can get them for a little bit lower. European colleges okay. still have applications open. Apprenticeships are still yeah. open. There's so much. Mm. Okay. So, uh, Terry, with the benefit of kind of, we've all been a few years since our even cert now, do, is it the be all and end all? Does it matter? Uh, it matters, but it's not the be all and the end all. And it never really was. I was thinking this morning coming in, I actually have never in my entire life been asked for my leaving cert. And I remember at the time working so hard mm. because I knew, okay, I don't have much of a brain, but God, I have hard work and getting what I needed. And then nobody asked me for it. It was quite a letdown. <laughs> but now <laughs> it's not even the rite of passage, by the way, that rite of passage. Mm. That thing of going back into the school yeah. where I hated every teacher <laughs> and where I hated every <laughs> other teacher. Bye-bye, <laughs> nah. bye. I am oh. done, this is over. <laughs> so yep. this is all good for you, Carla. Mm -hmm. Like when you think about when you got your leaving cert, what you went, you went on into college, you did three different courses. <laughs> yeah, so it's not, it's not like always exactly what you think it's going to be. So I was one of the, I was one of the very few that actually got my leaving cert results at home. So that was deadly because I could actually take it to like take it to the side myself and figure it out before yeah. I announced mm. to my family. Turns out I didn't get my first choice. <laughs> yes. Don't worry, guys. Really happy with my second choice. <laughs> so yeah, I ended up studying psychology first, dropped out of that. Then I went into multimedia, which is what I initially wanted to do, um, dropped out of that, and eventually went to work for a couple of years, and then finally completely um PR and event management mm. so yeah there's something important about that as well mm -hmm. you're 18 years old yeah. you haven't a clue yeah. what's going on a like it's so weird to ask people how are you 
here's what you're going to do for your entire life because we're told these days like Donica there's going to be you're going to have three sort of different careers in your life yeah so absolutely and uh, we would say as guidance counsellors if you're going into a degree try and make it as general as possible so if you know you kind of want to go into the area of business do a general business degree and then you can specialise in human resource or accounting or finance whatever you want to within that degree that's why I love arts degrees general science degrees general business degrees keep it as general as possible because you say Mwern you don't know what you're going to do at 18 mm. so the degree will lead you into the path that you're going to like to do. Yeah. But I think you're, you're so not alone. Like, how many people drop out after they get a year in, two years in, or even um, like six months? You know, they t did you, did you, did you did drop you out? I dropped out. Yeah. Absolutely. I had a chance to go to London and appear in the West End with the Abbey or continue with my uh, university course. And, you know, it wasn't that hard a decision because no. I hated I hated school, I hated, uni I hated everything. But the thing is that being a dropout it's not shameful anymore. There's yeah. other possibilities. Yeah. I, and we don't always think of them. I mean, there's a fascinating thing in this morning's mail uh, about construction as uh, a career with Hugh Wallace talking about people don't think about it, but it's an option. Similarly, in England at the moment, there's more people going for apprenticeships than are going for primary mm. degrees. The options are just fantastic these days. Well, even though, I mean, he might object to the term dropout, but the Taoiseach is a dropout. He never finished he his, his college course either, and he's doing pretty well for and himself. And done so much praising him. Yeah, I'm trying to be praising there as well, you know? But I didn't know that. Do you feel yeah. a bit, I'm really good. Do you feel there. a bit? Yeah, <laughs> but it is the sort of thing when you put things into context, mm -hmm. Carla, yeah. about life, but, but the pressure that's put on leaving her students. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. Like right now, mm -hmm. the quaking in their boots. I know I reacted by just going out for like uh, the week before <laughs> the CAO results were coming out. Yeah. You know, it's a lot. What do you think of it? I or do we need it? Look, we don't need it, but it's really hard to tell someone when this is the biggest thing that's going on in their life. That mm. Don't worry about it. Exactly. In 15 years, you might have done seven different careers and all this other kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's kind of not relevant in a way, but it isn't the be all and end all. And I think what's great now is that there is a lot more, I suppose, emphasis on PLCs. That wasn't something that was so big 15 years ago when I was doing my lead and search. That wasn't something that was, I suppose, explained that well. I think that there's so much more resource. People know how to use the internet properly. You know, mm. we're not just on MSN. Yeah. You know, we can actually go and do a few bits. <laughs> but it, does it feel a little bit like us sitting here? It's a bit patronizing mm. to people who are going through it right now to be yeah. like, don't worry about it. It's mm. not that big a deal. Like the pressure is there, Terry. Hardly, we're in, I think that we're in a, a lot better position than the people in media who are hyping it up and who yeah. are suggesting that you'll have a nervous breakdown, you might need to go to hospital, and um, you know, drink a lot of water, all of this nonsense. Or, or other things. It is just a phase. It's an exam. And if a family, and it can be families that mm. do this, are laying too much emphasis, the kid needs to say, back off. Mm. I'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. Donica, how do you... We all know, like, comparison is the... The joy of, uh, or the thief of joy, as the saying goes. Yeah. So, how do you deal with, particularly if you got a, a disappointing result, comparing to your friend who did really well, or your older brother or sister who did really well, and suddenly you're not in that great a situation? Yeah, and that's really difficult, and it's hard on the student, but it's all relative. You know, I've met people who have got 560 points who've been devastated. I've met students who've got 200 points and they've been delighted. So, it's all relative to the person. Try and not, I know it's easy for us to say not to compare yourself. And we used to say it when they came out of the exams as well don't start comparing what answers you have but that's really important and even we see on social media we're always comparing ourselves to other people's lives and things like that mm. it's really take it in look at it for yourself is it good for me did I put in the work did I get what I deserved and that's kind of what you're gonna have to focus on mm. 0896 triple one triple one. Uh, if you're in a situation, if you've got the, the gift of hindsight as to what happened in your life, we'd love to hear from you. If you've got someone in your house who's going through this and waiting for it on Friday morning, 10 a.m. 0896 triple one triple one. I've never described her as a dropout in my life, but that's what's happening. <laughs> Herself and the Taoiseach, Terry Prone. A pleasure as always to have you here. Uh, Carla Kay, thank you so much. And Donica, you know, every year, thank you for coming in no and calming us all down, Donica <laughs> Manny. Thank you so much, guys. Cheers. Now we have Jack O'Keefe making us a roast tomato curry with grilled halloumi. And it sounds All like a fan favourite yeah, you're you're making it. I know, <laughs> you're I'm, I'm salivating yeah. for hours already. The smell wafted through the garlic. It was voted for by you, the Ireland AM viewers. So what are we starting with, Jack? Story, lads. So the first thing to do, I suppose, 
at home is get our tomatoes. Head down to the supermarket. The reason I'm doing is August, September, tomatoes are everywhere and they're in season. And it's not like those nasty ones. When you open the fridge in your mother's house. Yeah. And they're <laughs> in the fridge. Are tomatoes not in season all year round? No. No. no, they're grown in polytunnels all year round. But like the real good stuff. But you stuff, can always mm. get a tomato. You can always get a tomato, but there's a difference at this time of the year. And you notice they, it even now when you go in, there's just more. There's like, oh, there's right. loads like, of them around at the minute. Like I walked into a German discount supermarket chain last <laughs> night. Um, <laughs> the one that started L. <laughs> and it smelled like tomatoes. And I went, class, perfect. Do you know, these are for me then. So I just take, I have a mix of plum tomatoes and I have a mix of cherry tomatoes on a tray. And I have some garlic cloves, four of them, just popped onto the tray like so. A little bit of salt, right? In on top of that, just for a bit of flavour, a bit of that summery kick, I'm going to take some lemon zest on a grater. Just get that onto it. And then cut that lemon in half. Squeeze it. So this is a real kind of Southern Indian inspired curry, just with a little kind of twist. Oh, and you put the lemon in as well? Put the lemon the in and everything, oven. it'll roast off it. That goes into the oven. How long does that go into the in oven for? at about 190 to 200 degrees for about 15, 20 minutes until they start to get nice, dark and charred. OK. OK? While that's in the oven. Now, while I'm, that's in the oven, let's let's give our next while we, <laughs> so that people have a chance to vote for it. <laughs> so what would you like to see Jack cooking next? Is it pork what? What's it? How do you think? Chicharron is. It's a Mexican kind of Southern, uh, Southern American uh, inspired recipe. It's basically pork cubes. Super, super crispy, almost like crackling, but pork belly pieces. Oh, sounds lovely. And you get those nice and crispy. And then I make a guacamole with passion fruit and avocado, smear oh. that in the plate and some raw onion on top. And then the other one is... Is a sausage cassoulet. Is a lentil cassoulet. It was a lentil stew cooked down in Irish artisan cider with a big mass of jumbo sausage popped on top of it, some Dijon mustard. OK, yeah. so get your phone up to that on the, the QR code on the screen now. And that's what you uh, that's what Jack, Jack will cook next. It'll stay up there while we're cooking this. So do you want really the pork difficult. or the yeah. sausage? No, right? No. So going yeah, with this curry, I'm going to serve it with some <laughs> lovely halloumi. In your Indian restaurant, you get paneer. It's a type of cheese that you cook as a meat substitute, right? You could use tofu, you could use chicken breast. I'm using some halloumi. Into a nice hot griddle. I don't season halloumi because it's quite salty, mm. right? It's a Greek cheese. It's quite salty. A little bit of rapeseed oil or olive oil on it and just char grill it. And all I'm going to do is just going to cook it gently on each side for a few minutes while I'm chatting away, OK? That's just going to go on top. Yeah, to be honest, you don't need it with this because it's really nice and summery. Okay. Onions, just sauteed after a little bit of colour in them. Yeah. In on top of those, I have some chopped ginger and chopped garlic. Just going to pop that in, right? This is all rustic. There's no blending. There's no nothing in it. Once that goes in, I'm going to add in some chilli powder, just a tiny bit, right? About a half a teaspoon to a quarter teaspoon, depending on your heat level. You mm. know me, but I know also know you. So. <laughs> we'll meet in the middle somewhere. You're a vegetarian. Do you like your food, though? Would you like to try and add more spice to oh, it just to, to give it the flavour? You have to. It, the first, like, for, when I first went, I'd say the first 10 to 20 meals I made were absolutely awful. Yeah. It's a great way to learn, like, to improve your cooking is to just go vegetarian you have or to vegan. The box. Because you have to. You, you know, yeah. you don't have the easy fats in the chicken or the yeah, beef or yeah. whatever, so and you have butter. to. <laughs> uh, or the butter, yeah. Right. So in, on top of that, some chilli powder, some garam masala and some fennel seeds. The fennel seeds are completely option. I love fennel, especially in the summertime. Fennel, tomatoes, just match made in heaven. Nice medium heat and the key to flavour with any curry is toast your spices in with the onions and the oil before you add your tomatoes ranting. That will awaken them up. Some brown sugar and I'm just using some jaggery which is an Indian sugar just because I had it and I said I'd use it rather than yeah, buying Where it. would you get it? Because you were saying this is the difference now between your home curry and your, your the curry you'd get out in Indian. Yeah, so like once every two or three months, myself and my wife would go into our local Asian market in Mallow and we actually just stock up on all our spices because they're much better quality and they're cheaper. Right. And we'll get that right. kind of stuff in there. We'll get idea, like your, your Indian ingredients, your Middle Eastern ingredients, your Asian ingredients, they all are in those stores, right? So that's just going into the onions. The onions nice medium sauteing okay? down. While that's sauteing down, we're going to get our tomatoes. So give that about two or three minutes. That's all it needs. So charred up tomatoes. And look at these. These yeah. are proper. And if you impressive. have a pizza oven at home, It'll completely change the game with these tomatoes. Bang oh, them into the pizza oven and get them really brown. The pizza oven? Yeah, pizza that oven and tomatoes. Roast there, yeah. them up. And for what, that, that'll only take you a couple of minutes. So the take the roast tomato uh, lemon and just give it a gentle squeeze like that. Just and to throw get it in the sink. Throw it yeah. in the sink. <laughs> <laughs> That's someone else's problem. Right. Right. The, clean up. Yeah. the garlic cloves. Just use your tongue and smush them down. Because again, I'm not blending this curry, so. I don't want to bite in. I don't want Alan Hughes to bite into a full. Uh, so this curry. is all goes in there then. <laughs> just dump is it all in. Is that it then? That's actually it. Wow. And then I just I have a little jug of water here next to me. So if it's too dry, I just add add some a drop of water to it. But I stew that in for about twenty minutes. And that's what you get across in the other pan. That's exactly what I get. Yeah. 
the halloumi oh, grilling up that. nice and delicious right now if you wanted to could you blend that down and make you it could like you a could nice make it super sauce smooth yeah. Super, yeah you could actually a bit more sugar blend it and it's like a curried ketchup oh you know so there's an idea to serve this up i'm just going to grab a ladle and then my stew down sauce which you can see has gone really nice see, i, lo I love that rather than it's blended too much yeah like Sometimes, like if I'd left over this now, I could add a little drop of coconut milk or double cream to it, blend it till it's completely smooth, freeze it, and then I can use it for a tikka masala or something in a few nights later. Lovely. Okay, Jack, well, we, the megaphone was 50-50. <laughs> so you have the deciding vote then. I no have the deciding pressure. vote. Yeah. <sighs> I'd say let's go with the lentils and sausage. Okay, the yeah, sausage cassoulet it is. Yeah, because yeah. there it is, it was 50% each. Um, so we're going to go with a sausage cassoulet the next time you're in then, Jack. And what do right. you put on top here now? So the that's so just some, some mint and some, some scallions. That's for you, Mr. Hughes. OK, well, I'll pass it down. Yeah. There you go. It's in that you're the vegetarian. You yeah. give your honest... Are you vegan or vegetarian? Uh, a vegan. A vegan. Yeah, Swap so I'll give you the cheese one. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'll take this one. I'll do one without... Oh, sorry. Right. And, and then we'll... for yourself, just uh, you could do that with tofu or you could do it with... Uh, what I love is get a can of chickpeas, strain it, mm. rinse off the water from the chickpeas, put chickpeas on an oven tray with parchment paper, some garam masala salt, and roast them at a high heat. Get them real crispy. Real crispy. And then what you do is don't mix them through the sauce, take them in your hands and crumble them over like a nut crumble on oh, top. So you're getting lovely. your protein and you're getting your texture. Oh, wow. That, yeah, the texture. It's just like a lovely hot curry. Yeah. Yeah. It's really it's nice. nice and comforting and it's yeah. great in the fridge. It lasts for a full week in a lunchbox. Jack, as oh, always, delicious. a pleasure. Thank you so much for that. So, um, Castellet, the next sausage, yeah. sausage Castellet. Oh, oh, very nice. <laughs> now, up, uh, up you go, up you go. Up next, uh, Derek is learning all about the flying boats at the Aviation Museum in Foynes County, Limerick. Which is also happens to be the birthplace of Irish coffee, so we might be getting a few of them. We'll see you after this break. Bye. Um, Derek is diving head first in today, testing the water in the Treaty County. That's right. O'Hartigan began his flying visit at the Foynes Flying Boat and Maritime Museum this morning. Yes, Derek, how are you getting on? Are you in the air? <laughs> yes, the flying visit. Well, we're not in the air, we're on the ground. But anyway, it's great to be down here in Foynes Flying Boat and Maritime Museum. Fintan, I've wanted to come down here for a long time, and it's great to be finally here. It's great to see you, and you're all welcome here to this unique museum. It's the only one of its kind in the world, and you won't see one like it again unless you come back through it here. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, Fintan, tell us about the museum itself. We've got lovely opening shots of the exterior of it. When was it set up? Well, it was opened proper in 1989, and one Maureen O'Hara cut the ribbon at that opening. More about her later on, but um, 1989 was when it opened first. But it was a whole different building then. It was much smaller. It was mainly the control tower, which we'll be seeing later. And um, it, uh, last year, there was a huge extension that opened up, and there was great excitement about that, and lots of footfall since that, because it hit Public, publicly hugely after that, and we're very proud of that. Uh, this museum itself, in fact, it's steeped in history and heritage, and I suppose you have to go back to 1939, in the middle of the World War, mm. uh, where it really was a uh, centre point, really, in terms of flights, transatlantic uh, flights. Oh, yes. This, now, you can imagine uh, how rural uh, this town of Foynes would have been back then, uh, and it was picked, believe it or not, to be the centre of the aviation universe. All. Uh, flights came through here to, to refuel and go further on, whether they're going to Europe, up to North Africa sometimes, or back to Newfoundland and on down to New York. They used Foynes, this little rural town, which is fantastic when you consider we were just a new state at that stage. Uh, and it's great to fact that the first transatlantic passenger plane landed in here. That's right. Uh, in 1939, uh, the first uh, plane came in, and it was the Yankee Clipper, famous uh, Yankee Clipper, and it landed here with 19 passengers. Now, those planes could carry up to 35 people, but 19 arrived that day, and it was mushroomed from that. Uh, during the war year, that war is writ large on this town and on, that, on this museum. During the war years, approximately 50,000 people came through Foynes, um, the, the airport, and they were mainly um, Allied soldiers to do with the war effort. And indeed, poignantly, there were at least about a thousand refugees, some of them child refugees, 
from war-torn Europe that came through this humble little... Well, I know we're going to see the Anki Clipper a little bit later on, mm -hmm. so you go around the back and we'll see you in a few because we're going to catch up with Natalie here. And Natalie, many famous faces, in fact, have passed through the doors here over the years. Yes, very, very many fa famous people have passed through here. You had the likes of John F. Kennedy, Eleanor Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, uh, Humphrey Bogart, Bob Hope, Gracie Fields. So many, many, anyone who was anyone back then. And there is a beautiful association as well with the late, great Maureen O'Hara. And we're in the room here now and we have lovely shots on air. Tell us about it. Yeah, so Maureen O'Hara was married to a very famous aviator named Charlie Blair. He was the last pilot to fly out of here in 1945. She opened the museum in 1989 and was the patron for her entire life until she died in 2015. And uh, then we acquired her entire collection, which we have here on display. And of course, there's that great connection with the quiet man. Absolutely. We have the original trap from The Quiet Man here on display as well and a lot of wonderful uh, uh, costuming from there as well. And the lovely thing about it is, is that Maureen O'Hara opened this museum uh, when she was with us. Yes, she did open the museum in 1989. She did the ribbon cutting and she came here every year for her birthday until her death in 2015. All right, so we're walking and talking here and we're moving into the next room. And this room had huge significance uh, back in the day, I suppose, because this is the Foynes radio room. Tell us about it. Yeah, so the radio room would have had all the original radio equipment from the time. These are the transmitters. Now we have the Marconi transmitter. It is the only Marconi transmitter left uh, today. And, and this is it here. Uh, the Marconi transmitter is actually here, this big yes. guy right yeah. here. And they would, uh, when they were away from land, they would uh, communicate by Morse code. Uh, but close by, they would do short and long wave. And this is the only one in the world, right here in Foynes. This Marconi is the only one in the world, yes. It's incredible. Yes, it? yes it is. I mean, so much history in one museum. Oh, so much history, Derek, definitely. And, and of course, Foynes is the birthplace of Irish coffee as well. Absolutely, it is, and you have to try one on your way out. Yeah, we will, absolutely. Now, we're going to finish out here because we're going to come back to Finton, and Finton, I suppose, this is your pièce de résistance, if you want to call it that. Tell us about the Yankee Clipper here. Well, there were 12 of those Boeing 314s manufactured None of them exist. They're all gone. But we've got the best, um, exa we've got the only example here. It's, it's a full-scale model of that plane. And it is the main exhibit in this museum. It's what makes it unique, in fact, and it is the wow factor. I enjoy the look on everybody's face who comes through here. They all go wow. I mean, we've shots of it now, hopefully, on air. And I mean, inside it, mm -hmm. it's, there's lots of space inside, right? Well, really, yes. You're, you're flying on, uh, like, a, a cruise ship. Um, now, of course, in order to fly in, on those boats, you had to be rich. I, I both, and sometimes very famous people came through here, but they were all, you could be sure of one thing, they were all very rich. I, I, I mean, in terms of the weight of this, to get this off the ground, an oh, incredible yeah, feat yeah. of engineering. Well, it weighed 40 tonne, and in order to lift that baby off the water, there were four huge, now, small by today's standards, but back in those days, 1,600 horsepower, uh, engine was massive and you can imagine the roar from those engines Oof. people came from miles around and you can imagine back then there was no noise pollution so the noise of those engines would have been heard from miles away well, so it's can, incredible well you it? can imagine rural ireland out in foynes and that machine <laughs> coming in it was Awake spectacular and um, yeah. before we let you go where can we find out more noise their website there is a website which Natalie will give you later on. All right, yes, OK, yes. we'll have more on that. Thank you so much for your tour here this morning. Okay, we really enjoyed you. so many people coming down here to Foynes. Well worth the visit if you're in the heart of the Midwest. But for me, Finton, and of course, Natalie, back to you guys in studio. Thank you That's so incredible much. Incredible looking, the size of it. You're, you're talking about Cessnas and everything going on yeah. here. You've gone aviation mad. <laughs> so they have both converted. of the lads. And now coming up, something um, completely going sex different. <laughs> sex guru Jenny Keane will be giving tips and tricks to help keep the spark alive if it's something that you think your children might find a little bit sensitive or you might find a little bit sensitive. Here is your warning. Uh, stylist Rob Condon has got big cat energy on the catwalk. I wonder uh, what that means. And our science guy, <laughs> Bill Smith, <laughs> is giving us a play-by-play -play of the digestive system in very graphic detail, mm. apparently. See you back here after a few. This week on Ireland AM, we've teamed up with Breast Cancer Ireland to give away a his and hers Fitbit and entry to the Very Pink Run every day this week. The 2024 Very Pink Run is back again with an option for participants to take part in either one or all three of our physical Very Pink Run live events. 
being held in Dublin on the 31st of August, Kilkenny on the 1st of September, or Cork on the 8th of September. You can run, jog or stroll, something for everyone. Every fun-filled step taken as a part of the Very Pink Run is a step closer to saving lives. A fun-filled experience for you and a powerful act for those affected by breast cancer. For more information, visit verypinkrun.ie. For your chance to win, just answer this question. How many colours are in the rainbow? A, 2, B, 7. To enter, call 1550 treble or text WIN to 57199. Best of luck. Good luck with that. Now, some news uh, just in. The trailblazing writer and feminist uh, Nell McCafferty, uh, she has died overnight. Her family confirmed her death this morning at a nursing home in County Donegal. She was 80 years old. I think all of us know Nell from her writing, her work on the Kerry Babies case, every mm. single appearance that she had on The Late Late Show, yeah. the work that she has done on civil rights um, in this country for years and years and years. And it was just her 80th birthday earlier mm. on this year and the yeah. Irish Times did an amazing special for her where loads of people were writing about her. Yeah. Um, shocking that she's gone because she feels such a part of Irish life. Yeah, yeah. sort of always there, so wasn't she? Yeah. And I was just listening to um, the new documentary on Mary Robinson mm. and that although Mary Robinson didn't get involved in a lot of the stuff that they were doing, she was there behind the scenes advising them on an awful lot of stuff and how she spoke about Nell saying that she like Ireland wouldn't be the same without her, especially mm. for women. Yeah. Yeah. And even like others, oh, Michael D. Higgins uh, mm. praising her on her 80th birthday and saying she was a, a friend and ally. Anyone who was a friend and ally of hers was fortunate in, their, in being given the gift of experiencing humanity in all its possibilities, which is kind of a nice little phrase to sum up. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It yeah, was amazing. Kind of she was. And to still watch herself and Gayburn go at it mm. in those really in the years. It was fascinating and a wonderful thing to see. Our thoughts are with her family and friends, and I'm sure that we'll be talking about her more yeah. uh, tomorrow. Uh, so rest in peace, Nell McCafferty. And uh, lots of texts coming in about um, the leaving results. We were talking about them and a, a lot of students waiting on their leaving results this week. And we're going to, how important are they? And they are like at this at this moment, for so many students, it is like, oh my God, mm -hmm. like if I don't get it, what am I going to do? My my life is ruined. And like Terry yeah. Prone and all saying earlier on, like it's not, it, if you don't get it, don't panic, but then it's easier said than done. And Mary was saying, Mary had an opinion on this as well. She says, I think it's great that you don't have to go to the school anymore to get the results. I remember taking my daughter to get her results and the, the screaming of joy or the roaring of crying yeah. in <laughs> no different corners. Be. My daughter was would, wouldn't get wouldn't open our results until she got into the car. She did well, thank God. But the whole experience of that for some it is joyous to meet all yeah. your friends, open it up and get it. But then for others it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. And to be able to, to stand there in front of everybody, go, I didn't do well. And now you can get them on the portal on Friday morning. No longer go to the school. That's it. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, my son had no idea what he wanted to do after his leaving cert. He did a PLC. Then he went on to college to do a degree, and he went on following that to do a master. So remember, if you don't get in this time, there are always other options. Yeah. Like you said. yeah. I got my leave in probably one of the strangest places people got. I was on a boat. So I had one that summer, a, one of those tall ships trips. You know, the ones, the tall ships yes. in Dublin. Yes. And so my mother had to go and collect my results and she emailed them to the, the German captain of this <laughs> boat who came into me very confused and handed me a letter <laughs> as I was seasick in the bunk. <laughs> so I got it, looked at it. I was like, OK, that'll do. <laughs> Back to getting sick in the toilets. So, Beautiful. Uh, yeah, Beautiful memories of your leaving results. Gorgeous yeah. things. There you Gorgeous go. things. Any, any other strange places that you got your leaving <laughs> results other than and, you know, the bells of a ship or in the school or the <laughs> online portal, let us know on the text. Absolutely lovely. We'll be speaking about bells a little bit uh, later on. Um, as always, you can get in touch with us 0896 111 Now, up next, if your sex life has gone stale, well, don't worry, we've got you covered. Sex educator Jenny Keen will be with us after the break to inspire us to keep the passion alive. It might be a good idea if you've got little eyes and ears listening to maybe give them the iPad for a few minutes or encourage them to go for a run out in the back garden. We'll see you back here in a few minutes. Welcome back. Now, this is your final warning. I'm saying this in a very friendly way. This is science based, but our next topic may not be suitable for little ears in the room. Yes, because we are talking all about the importance of novelty in the bedroom to keep the spark alive. And here to tell us about how to have that conversation with our partner is sex educator Jenny Keane. It's lovely <laughs> to have you here, Jenny. Thank how are you? you? I'm really good, thank you. This is Sean's first Jenny experience. Yes. So he's like, I'm let's. Fascinated. We got let's the go. whips, yeah. we got the ropes. <laughs> just for <laughs> me, just for me. <laughs> She's just. Sean's like, sorry, what? <laughs> this is, but this is very much based in science yeah. about 
spark, we'll say, whatever that is, the chemistry, diminishing in a relationship over mm -hmm. time. Why is that? Yeah, well, th this is really common. It's such a common experience. So we all know that when new relationships begin, the sex can, you know, it's generally quite easy and very natural. You don't really have to put too much work into it because the sex is very new, it's exciting. Everything about your partner is new and exciting. But over time, you begin to know your partner, or I suppose you think you know your partner, and, and, and things just become very run of the mill, right? And so even though keep like even though this thing of diminishing desire is one of the most common phenomenons in relationships, people tend to still um, interpret this as there being something wrong with themselves or their partner or their relationship. And one of the most common questions that I always get then is how to keep the spark alive, you know, yeah. <laughs> as a result of this. And, you know, there's amazing research that has been done that says, you know, and it kind of quantifies the amount of sex people are having over time in a relationship. And they mm. say up to the first year, couples are having up to 14 sexual different sex Sexual, sexual experiences a month and then after that there's a very sharp drop to where it goes to six sexual experiences a month and then after about three to six years it's then one every other month right yeah. and I think these figures can also change depending on what you've experienced in your relationship you know yeah I was surprised it was that low after six years once every other month sounds like very little. All right, yeah. well, I'm just <laughs> insights. Yeah, you're giving just, us an insight. You've got to be careful about how much you give away. It's yes. quite a big drop. Off. But like yeah. it, it is because I mean, six years is not that long a time for a lot of people. You could be going out six years without, yeah. you know, yeah. engaged or without being married or any of that. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's not like this is something that after 20 years in a relationship that you're suddenly seeing a drop off. It's pretty yeah. quick. And, and there's so many different reasons for this. Like one of them is is that we have two different types of uh, desire responses, and one of them is spontaneous desire, and the other is responsive desire. And after the first couple of months, like so it tends to be spontaneous desire is present in the beginning of a relationship, right? You don't need to do anything. You're just talking and then suddenly it's like you can't keep your hands off each other, right? Um, whereas after a couple of months, a couple of years, you know, things become normal. You get into routines, you get into habits. And what you need is actually something, an act or something to inspire or that you can respond to. And that's what responsible desire is. So if you never have the urge, like if you, after let's say a year or a couple of years, if you never have the urge to have sex again in a relationship this is because you're you have responsive desire and you need something to stimulate you because mm. you know it just makes sense like we've all sat there on the edge of our bed staring into our wardrobe going I've got nothing to wear and there's hundreds of things inside there. Yeah. but you're like I've worn these I just can't be bothered with it I'm done yeah. with it I can't see anything so this is where novelty mm. comes in because you'd be worried here that when you don't have that desire that cheating isn't Cheating is a thing. Yeah. Or just that, that your relationship is going to disintegrate. It disintegrate. Yeah. And because sexual sexual satisfaction is a really huge indicator for relationship satisfaction. Um, and actually, we're really interestingly, relationship satisfaction isn't dependent on sexual satisfaction. So that means that, you know, if you're emotionally connected or even mentally connected and stimulated, you can still have a really great relationship. However, we know that when sexual satisfaction is present, it has this massive impact okay. for your overall relationship satisfaction. And not Novelty is massive, right? Because I would say novelty is a really important ingredient to sexual desire because over time, over years, we develop, we fall into rhythms, we develop habits, you know, and novelty is this thing that can inject newness, inject excitement, right, into a relationship. And and if you if you kind of know what's coming sexually, oftentimes other priorities, you know, like good sleep if you have a little baby, <laughs> you know, or what, yeah. <laughs> She's in the middle of that. <laughs> or, um, or, you know, chilling in front of Netflix or something like these things will actually trump intimacy, right? So when you aren't expecting something, when there's new and exciting things that you're in, you're injecting into your relationship, this can actually trigger that, um, that sexual satisfaction. And once, what's really interesting is when you, when you work with novel acts and inject novel acts into your sex life, it actually has a trigger where it um, has a positive impact on sexual satisfaction, which then has this positive feedback loop, right? The more you're sexually sat satisfied, the more you're going to want to try new things. The more you're trying new things, the more you're sexually satisfied. See, this is, so you're, you keep on saying the word novel. I'm sure there's people at home going, oh my God, what's she talking what about? Hold novel? on a second. Yeah, how what? far does novel go? But people don't have to be afraid. This isn't no, like, you, you no. don't have to change your whole personality. 
originality to keep the no, spark alive. I, and that, that's so important. So, so a lot of times when we talk about the word novel, people are thinking, Jesus, I've got to get the chains and the whips out and I've got to tie them, tie them to the bed, you know, that kind of way. Um, and really, when we talk about novel, you actually don't have to step too far out of the norm. So it could be that the, the acts that they actually discussed in this study are very um, easy to um, implement. So one of the top ones that they suggest is trying a new sex position, right? Uh, another one would be um, organizing a date night. Another one would be giving or receiving a massage, right? So um, introducing a sex toy, right? Okay. Um, or even going sex toy shopping. And then I also as well would include things like that are even easier, you know, listening to a podcast about sex together, you know? Um, or what about um, one of the easiest things is you know, at recalling a sexual memory, you know, can you describe in detail the first time that we had sex? These things stimulate your sexual kind of energy in the relationship. Okay. And they're really easy, like low energy yeah. ways yeah. to kind of, you know, in inject novelty yeah. into a relationship. So like, we're not very good at talking about sex as mm -hmm. a, a race, the Irish people. Mm -hmm. So if you, if it's something you just haven't really ever talked about because you never needed to at the start, and then you, like you say, you maybe fell into a bit of rut. How do you go about opening that conversation Conversation, and particularly if you think your partner might be a bit reluctant about trying some of this stuff. Yeah, okay, so the first thing that I always say is that acknowledge that the conversations around sex aren't modelled, so therefore we kind of think conversations around sex are a really big deal, whereas actually they're just like any other conversation, and people are like, oh, no, not really. <laughs> but the more you actually talk about sex, the easier it becomes. So I always give these two tips, really important that when you start discussing sex, you're talking about it outside of the bedroom, not inside, um, and this is really important because sometimes people can take offense or become a little bit like, oh, are they saying something that I'm not good enough or something like this? So talking about it outside of the bedroom actually is really important for um, keeping that vulnerability out, uh, away from the conversation. And the other thing that I always say is make sure that you're moving. So like go for a walk, go in the car. If you're sitting in front of each other and you say like, so like let's introduce <laughs> something new, you know, the other person can be like, oh God, I've got nowhere to go, right? And it, you can feel very stuck. Whereas if you're walking, it actually keeps the energy moving and can actually keep the conversation flowing as well. And then it's literally just asking very simple questions. Like the people who are watching today, they can say like, I actually watched um, a, a segment on RL AM earlier and this girl was talking about adding novel acts into a relationship. What do you think about these acts? And that stimulates the conversation, mm. right? It well, can just be a little way to kind of you know, Get start in the door, it. Yeah. Wedge it yeah. In, yeah, because it is sort of like I think that's so interesting that you say rather than sitting down having something that feels almost confrontational. Yeah, that it is just this is a huge part of our lives and yeah. in us staying together. Yeah, because as you've said, it's circular. Yes. And I think as well, like, you know, if you're, th if you're thinking about sitting in a car or walking, you're both facing forward. So it can be a little bit easier because you're not looking at these minute little changes on people's faces where you're like, oh God, they're terrified. You know, that kind of way. So it can help you continue the conversation, okay. you know. <laughs> okay. How many or how many times should you be trying something new? Because there is some stuff in the research about there also being a cap on trying yes. new stuff that you're getting diminishing returns beyond being too adventurous. Yeah, I have to say, like, even as a sex educator, I was really happy to see this. This, you know, <laughs> because the thing about sometimes novel acts, like, and even, you know, uh, kind of trying to keep the spark alive, it can feel like a lot of energy, you know, especially when you have so many responsibilities, like you're, you know, you're working, you're trying to take care of your kids, you're trying to like keep on top of the housework, you know, mm -hmm. these these things all take energy out of us. So sometimes when you're like, oh, jeepers, now I have to like try and keep the sex alive as well, it can feel very daunting and very big. Yeah. Whereas this research said that people who attempted, who kind of went over the numbers of 10, 11 or 12, acts a year, there was actually no change in set of sa sexual satisfaction. So uh, what basically it was saying was that introducing one novel app or aiming to introduce one novel act uh, a month, right, in the year is actually uh, the, the sweet point, you know, okay. when it comes okay. to sexual satisfaction or cultivating that. And as you said, it, it doesn't have to be literally sex-based. It could be like, I got new underwear, babes. Yeah. Do you like them? Like, yeah. it, it can be something well, else actually, or wearing, does it have to be sex-based? No, no, wearing lingerie was actually another one of the top acts that kept coming up, you know. Um, and, and as I said, like, you know, it can be anything new. So this wasn't part of the research, but we know from other research that any kind of novel act, so whether that's like, I don't know, 
you and your partner go and do an obstacle course together or something like this, that actually is creating that newness. And the, the reason is, is that it's actually putting oh. you both in that beginner mindset again, right? Okay. So you think in the beginning of relationships, like we don't know each other. So we're really open to exploring and discovering and experimenting. And it's okay if we get it wrong, because sure, we don't know each other. After a couple of years, there's this expectation that we're supposed to know what we're doing. And so therefore stepping out of your comfort zone and going to learn something new can feel very daunting because you're like, oh, I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to be bad. I don't want us to have a bad experience. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pressure. Whereas when you're both going to kind of going into that beginner mindset, learning something new, whether it's taking a cooking class together or you're learning how to like tie somebody up, right? Um, that there's kind of, there's, there's <laughs> a band that, that of, takes... uh, of different experiences. <laughs> that, took, it? that took a leap Ooh. there, my friend. Or scouting, scouting. We, we, you almost got there. We, we almost got through with a tie anyone up. My <laughs> God. So you get the rope out, you know? <laughs> or even like the wooden spoon, you know, a little spank, you know, here. It doesn't have to cost you anything, you know, the kind of way. Um, and also like lube is really great as well because most lubes actually can add like can you can use it as a massage oil you know so this was one of the things yeah. give or receive a massage was another act you know but basically learning anything new puts you guys into that discovery and exploration mode that you actually were already in in the beginning mm. so you've Lisa. changed the wooden, wooden spoon for generations <laughs> of Irish people in 10 seconds there Jenny Keane as always people can find you online yeah. I'm Jenny Keane of course doing all your courses all that kind of stuff and yeah. the shop is the shop is o-moment.com. Yeah. For now, so if you want to always. learn new skills, Sean. There you go now. We'll be on it in the break. We're just staring at you now, Jenny Keane. I know, yeah, no Thank pressure. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Coming guys. up, are you all right? Is I'm it good, okay I'm for good. you? I survived. Is I it survived. okay for you? Yeah. Good. Okay. Coming up, Rob Condon is putting the cat in catwalk this morning. He'll be showing some classic leopard print styles very shortly. See you back here. <laughs> Welcome back, and it is fashion time. We're putting the cat into catwalk this morning. <laughs> yes, stylist Rob Condon shows us the best way to wear leopard print. Good morning to you, Rob. Good morning. And as we were saying earlier on, it's back again. It, it is. just goes and comes back. It is, and it's back. But you know what? Usually there's hints of it back. This season, it is back. It's everywhere. No matter what shop you walk into, there's loads of leopard print. So we're definitely going to see it throughout the season. If you don't like it, good luck. Get oh, a yeah, more bit look. Exactly. and go yeah. with it. Exactly. Some people would sort of find it, oh, I can't wear that. Some people would, but I think the way to do it is, if you're kind of scared of leopard print, is to kind of go with a hint of leopard print. So that could be an accessory, like a bag or a pair of like runners. Like mirroring with our little belt yeah, this exactly. morning. Like our Just little leopard little print pop. belt. And leopard print also goes great with colours like black bow, bright so don't be afraid to mix okay. leopard print okay. with black bowl. There is our first uh, outfit today. Yes, and all of our looks this morning are available from Swords Pavilions, but I've gone to River Island for this look here. So I've gone all out leopard print with this. It's a suit, it's all about sleek tailoring with this look here. Um, first up, we have the blazer, which is just a really great fit to this blazer. I like that it's a long line blazer. Mm. It's got faux pockets to it, the really nice lapel detail into it. It's a little bit slouchy and oversized as well, what it, which is what I like about it, especially if you're someone who's gonna throw this blazer with jeans yeah. and a white t-shirt, you want to have that little bit kind of borrowed from the boys, a little bit masculine tailoring with it. And you've mixed it with that color That's, of yes. the season, that burgundy. Yes, we're this seeing a lovely so top. beautiful burgundy. So oh, it works really top. well with leopard print. I love this top. It's that one shouldered, lots of detail into the side of it there on the arm, and then it belts in. Now it is quite long as well, so you could wear it as oh, a longer so you've length. Just to tucked it. It in. We've tucked it in this morning and brought the belt to the top, but you could definitely that top even with a pair of like black oh, jeans lovely. would look mm. great, yeah. Yeah. Gorgeous. And then if you don't want to overdo the leopard print, just maybe the trousers yeah. with the top. You could perfect. definitely, yeah. you can see it works really well with the maroon, so you could do that. Even if you want to make it a little kind of rock chick, you could throw a leather jacket over mm -hmm. your shoulders with it, just change it around a little bit. But these are a great pair of trousers here. They're high-waisted, really nice fit to them. Um, you could add a belt in there at the side um, with it, but a great fit and flair to these trousers. And then we've the matched in the shoes here. They're pointed sling back shoes. So you can see the paint detail into them there. A really great piece. But if you're a little bit scared of leopard print, you could do these shoes, just these shoes with like say a bold block, bright yeah. hair, bright trouser, um, or even a black dress and throw on those shoes with it. Would Lovely. And you've got great. some jewelry. Oops. And finish it off there with these 
uh, gold hoop earring, which I think just work really well. And then the, the bag look. sort of matching and the color at the top. Bringing the maroon bag back in there. There's kind of a um, shine to this material here. And then that gold buckle detail in there just works. Really That's nice. a great look. Yeah. Fabulous, mm. Sarah. Thank you so much for that one. That is a really good look there. Uh, blonde, so how are you, you going to do leopard print with blonde today? We've gone a little bit more casual oh, with blonde here with this look, but equally a really cool look. It's a little bit preppy as well with that kind of white tee and leopard print skirt here. Because you can make it really simple. That's yeah. the thing with leopard yeah, print. You, you can just do black tea, grey yeah. tea, white tea. Exactly. And then you've got your print that's doing all the time. Yeah, and I would oh. say for anyone, never throw out your slip skirts because I've got my one yes. from Topshop from 10 years ago. And leopard if, yeah, print one. Exactly. And so many people do have leopard print in their wardrobe and it might be about buying something that's going to go with it to make it work. Great skirt here. I love the length of this skirt as well. It is a long skirt and blonde is quite tall. So if you're smaller, you're going to get a little bit more length out of that as well. Has a little bit of a swish to the end of it. Yeah. Um, and it's elasticated waistline. I just think it's a really great leopard print. A little bit of a shine to the material as well. Um, and then we've matched it in with these with the really little. cool pair of shoes. So you can do kind of different tones of leopard print as well. And it works really well. Yeah, it does. The black mm. detail into them there as well. It just breaks up that leopard print. I um, love the oversized sunglasses that you've gone with here as well. Yeah, a really cool pair of oversized sunglasses. I think it just suits the look because it is that really cool preppy look mm. with this. Uh, blonde is always put into the sunglasses. Great face for sunglasses, <laughs> Blonde. She can't be bothered with the, uh, can't be yeah. bothered with the lights. With the <laughs> oversized uh, um, sunglasses. The earrings there as well. Yeah, we've gone with a really simple oh, but cheek cool. earring here. They're a hammered gold, but they're a matte finish to these. So I think it just works great with that white yeah. t-shirt as well. And then again, as you said, like colours, you can clash the leopard prints yeah. A slightly different leopard print yeah, again exactly. with the bag. Yeah, slightly different and colour leopard work print like here. It. Um, it's going to work because the bag is quite the leopard print to the runners of this, yes. but it is clashing with the skirt of it, but it works. So it's about kind of finding those leopard yeah. prints that will work together. And you're going to make a statement if you do it. Lovely, Lovely. that's a great yeah. skirt. Really good skirt. Yeah. As you said, just keep that. Oh, yeah. We'll come back again. 100% yeah. to yeah. keep it. Exactly. And this is, yeah, is this like. We've gone a little bit more subtle with this. Yeah. So you do have that kind of big cat energy in it. You've got the vibe of the leopard print. It's lovely there, blouse. It's a gorgeous piece. They are a two piece. They're available from Zara at Swords Pavilions. But I just love the oversized blouse here with this. I love the button detail into the arm. You can see it's all about that arm detail and mm. fully down. Oh, with yeah. There. Um, and it's quite, it's quite a long shirt. Are as they well, actually so poppers the on the arm? Yeah. Yeah. Really? So you could open okay. it up. I think <laughs> it's just a design detail. Oh, a design. We're not gonna we're not uh, gonna okay. open it up. And then and the trousers are gorgeous. Trousers again, a gorgeous pair of high waisted trousers. Pocket detail to it. And what I love is the slit to the, the slit side down of these the side, trousers. Yeah. Um, but this is a little bit more of a subtle leopard print. So if you're someone who mm. wants to kind of do it more subtle, this is the outfit yeah. for you with this two piece. Again, you could do like the maroon top we saw earlier on. You could do it with these trousers here and would work. Equally and the shoes. Nice. And then I've seen the these shoes, a lot of places. We've gone to Mango with these and they're a mule, really great mule. They're soft leather to the front and then they're quite a, a thick heel to the back of them as well. So you're going to get a little bit more comfort than a stiletto. Yeah, and drop down earrings as well, yeah, chunky earrings. A really statement earring here with these. That's a real statement yeah. earring. Even just a simple black dress with these earrings is mm. going to make a statement. It's they're a gorgeous piece to add. Lovely. Thank to your you. Wardrobe. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so thank much you so for that. Lovely. Number three now. Now Sarah's back with us. Yeah, Sarah is back with us in her look here. So we've gone a little bit Western romance with the letter with this look here. We've gone all out cowboy hat and that beautiful leather jacket. I is it a well, pure leather jacket? It works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really great, really industrial vibe to that jacket with the zip detail to it. A little bit oversized as well, but I think it just works so well with this leopard print dress underneath it. It's a slip dress and it just, look at the shape of it, the fit, the flair to it. The length is great as well. It's not too short for a slip dress. Yeah. It's just a really gorgeous piece. Even throwing a knitwear jumper over this and belting it would look mm. great. 100%, yeah. that's the way it yeah. can be, it yeah, can be you worn. Can, you can, layer it up and especially coming into autumn winter, you want that piece that you're going to be able to layer up in your wardrobe. And gorgeous. just the suede boots with this Yeah, here. just keeping that really Western um, vibes going on, we've gone with the suede boots here. Again, these would go great with jeans, lots of things in your wardrobe, a really autumn colour in those boots. They're also available in black as well. Lovely, the hat, the hat, the yeah. hat. And then finishing off the look with this really cool hat, especially if you do have any any festivals coming up or any left to go to. Um, <laughs> Did you, you just definitely say that just the hat. tickets have gone on sale for Electric Picnic? Today. Today. Well, there yeah. you go. Our manager, Derek, there's 37,000 people ahead of him. <laughs> well, if you want to Derek. <laughs> oh, bless him. Oh. Um, so get ready for Electric Picnic next yeah, year. Yeah, if, if you want to be extra prepared, you can get it all at Swords Pavilions. Oh, I ah, love yeah. it. Sure, Swords Pavilions. And yeah. there all the time.
Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, you, Sarah. That is absolutely gorgeous. Rob Condon, as always, thank you so thank you. very much. Now, coming up next, Phil of Science is here to tell us how poo gets produced. Yeah, well... He's telling you how yeah, to do that. We're going to find out after the break. See you in a Full few of minutes. It. Full of it. Full of it. Now, it is very important to look after your gut health, and to do that, we need to know about the digestive system and how it works. And here to tell us how poo gets made, it's scientist Phil Smith. You have to yeah. go there, Yeah, you? there's yeah. Not, no you fine point. There. There's no way you can subtly say <laughs> no. that. I mean, and this is part good of Good morning, like, Phil. How are you? Also, good morning. Yes, yeah. this is my life, making poo on telly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the digestive system, it's a system, obviously. But it's something we all do. Everybody yeah. does, no matter who you are. And yeah. also, the stigma around is something you want to get rid of, because kids love talking about it. Poo, yeah. <laughs> and then it becomes... Farts and poo. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If you want to be a cool uncle or aunt, they're like, just, oh, my God, talk about this kind of stuff. <laughs> but then we get this kind of, like, shyness about it or whatever mm. else. And as it becomes, and later on, People stop talking about it, and then that becomes an issue because you're embarrassed, and if something's wrong, you won't talk about yeah. it. So doing these types of things is actually good crack, but it's also setting up things. Okay, for okay. so we're going to start. Yeah, but tell us about our digestive system. Going, yeah. Where does it start, and where does it? Well, we know where it ends, but yeah. where does it start, <laughs> and what happens as it goes through? Sure. Well, it starts. So we have a little model here. We have a little, here, little, 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 little yeah. model, uh, unlike the ones we had earlier. So it starts in your mouth. Obviously, yeah. the digestive system, a list of or a link of organs. Could you get anything smaller? No. No. Budget, but. Limited. <laughs> so it starts in your mouth, you break it down, it goes down your esophagus, then into your stomach, then your liver and your gallbladder put bile in. There it is, there. The okay, we have, Thank you very much. We have a graph much. now. We so can it look goes at into your biology small now. intestine, which is uh, actually longer than your large intestine. The small intestine is about six metres so long. So it goes into okay. the small one first. Yes, and then into the large intestine where the colon is and all the way out through. And to what's the happening as it's going through your small intestine, your large intestine? So small intestine is really about getting the nutrients out and really kind of extracting oh. all the Okay, and then nice. the large intestine is there as the last bit to extract more of the, the water or the moisture out and then what's left gets excreted out. And does some stuff take longer to go through you than others? Absolutely. Um, we well, might start actually getting this kind of mixed yeah. up and get through. So some stuff with higher levels of protein or stuff that's harder to break down takes longer to go come out of your system right. where stuff like sugars or like fast food or those types of things get actually broken down much quicker. So it's in and out of your system quicker which is why you don't feel as full. As full after. Okay, right. So what we have is kind of we're going to build a model of our digestive system. We're going to go through it. Okay. So we have a breakfast for each, each of you here. Lovely. We've got a banana. Now, is this good? A weed a bix and a banana. Weed a bix and a banana. I had banana. I have bananas most mornings. Yeah, easy to digest, kind of stuff. Good potassium as well. But you're looking at stuff that also people always peel your bananas from this end as opposed to the other end. Some people bring it the other way. It's weird. That's the monkeys do it. The it? monkeys do it, yes. Yeah, so you them. So we're going to do, you have a little bag here, which is what you're going to put it into. So we're going to start by putting oh, so the, we're putting this in here. Putting it into there. Okay. So we're going to put the, right. this into there and we're going to start just breaking it up. So this is just you chewing. So just the fun one to do at home masti now. Or what's Mastication. 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 Not to be confused. Yeah, with, uh, it's very important, very isn't it? Important. Because you're saying the more you chew, the smaller bits that go in. Yes. And that helps the digestion. It, it also has something to do with making you feel fuller. That if you, I've heard if you, if you, you're meant to chew for 30 seconds or something, and you will, which is an awful long time to be Yes, chewing. it would. It, it, so it helps, obviously. The biggest thing that you're doing with that is in, helping it to go down your esophagus so it's not block, blocking your throat, but also that the surface area is increased. So if you crush something down, the acid that's in your stomach is able to react with it on a larger level, larger surface area. So it actually breaks the food down quicker and you don't feel as bad. Now, what else is in your mouth? that might help you chew apart from, or go down your toes apart from teeth. Your saliva. Saliva, exactly. Right. So what we want is just to measure out into this, if you measure out 10 uh, milliliters of water into that little tiny cup. Wow, this really the, is going back yeah, to exactly, chemistry and the exactly. demon And this is part of why this is also educated. So why is it called Where's a beaker? Where's 10? Oh, There's uh, down that one. Oh, right. So, <laughs> so these Eating are called the glasses beakers for because they have a little beak at the edge. Oh, and okay. What you're actually teaching kids, apart from just actually the digestive system when you're doing this, you're teaching them basic skills of measuring and you're teaching them basic skills Oh my God, look at this. I know, it's starting to go. Oh, starting it's to... starting. Mine looks very runny now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, saliva also oh. has enzymes in it. So if I give you one of those, yeah. I'll just, so why don't you just add some baking soda? It also helps... How much baking soda? One of those spoons, please. Okay, so this oh. is our enzyme. That's what our are enzymes they going in. So, we're gonna put so the, what, what are the enzymes doing? So they're helping to break it down, starting the food to break down in our systems already. So okay. This, so, we're mixing so this is the enzyme gone in now as uh, well. Enzyme and water. I'm going to eyeball this as well, because, you know, I mean... That's, that's a bit tenor, right? Proper you know, science. Like that's, when, that's... You, when you have your poo, yes, I and do. you sort of say, 
how do you know if it's a healthy poo? Oh, well, there's a chart. Oh, the wonderful Bristol stool chart. If you've ever had this. <laughs> the a great... Bristol stool chart. So it's one to seven. And depends So like ones are generally really like you want to look at all the way from constipation yeah. into about a four, which is like sausage shaped and easy to pass all the way down to like, you know, di like diarrhea, Runny and diarrhea, and diarrhea. And yeah. way. So this is kind of you can start to see like it's breaking it down. But in yeah. your system, also what you have is acid, which helps break it down. So you have vinegar here as well. So add it. So again, the little measuring ten, cup, ten, ten, ten again. milliliters again of this. So in your stomach, you have hydrochloric acid. Which is, really is this going to start getting solid then or will it just stay runny like well, is this? I'm worried, is this going to explode? Again, this is part of what comes out the other end is a really good indication of what's happening in your system, but also, you know, how healthy your system is. So in this, you've got, so you'll start reacting with the enzymes, your gallbladder and your liver have start putting stuff in, start mixing up, you can start to see it's getting this kind yeah. of way. Yeah. You've also, once it's got, like your stomach is like, as you see in the model, it's up here. Yeah. Stomach isn't down here, that's where your intestines are. And your intestines do a fabulous job of extracting uh, lots of stuff, but it's helped by other parts in the system, other organs. So other thing I'd like you to add in is some bile. So this is your bile, your green bile. Oh. So another uh, five milliliters. So again, you're learning, the kids are learning five mils. So this measuring is, skills. This is so you the awful get stuff get down really low and have it measured out. So you teach there. them how yeah. to do these types there of things. Go. Five. So every experiment has a practical element that could be used in life for another experiment. I never thought you I would be making, making poo. I mean, well, live on telly. Live on telly. Well, well, we're always, always an doing example, it. Never an never an example of what poo might look like so or what we're doing So you've got to see it's kind of getting mixed up a bit. Yeah. When you go into your small intestine, you've got your, your gut microbe, microbiome. Yeah. So you've got lots of things inside there that help break down your bacteria inside it. Yeah. Lots of research got, on that lately. So, yeah, there is how important bisto. it is. So bisto, so these are like gravy granules are going to represent the microbiome that are okay. inside your system. How many spoonfuls? Two of those, please. So two again, so measure again, but it's also, you imagine kids doing this at home on a kitchen table, yeah. mixing, playing, going, oh, yeah. mom, look Last at this, Last few days awesome. before school, get, get them this in. kind of thing, mixing it all up together. Can I ask you, yes. is it, is it a good idea to look at your poo after you've had a poo? Yes, and this is because, part of like, the Because, like, for blood spots and things like that, very important. Yeah, it is. And it kind of gives you a really good indication of, like I said, what health is happening inside. I know, like, it's not yeah. that. No, no, I well, see. it's important. Mir like. Mirren's, like, you're looking at me going, oh, here's the hypochondriac now, like, you're <laughs> no. trying to find out, is there anything wrong with me? But and there, how many lots... poos a day is normal? Oh, good question. Oh, yeah. How many should we be, how often should we go? How a day? So anything between three a day and three a week is normal. Oh, that's a big what? range. It's a big range. Big that's what you're saying. It's also, it depends on like... So that you could go a full day without going to have Oh, yeah. I would easily. I'm sometimes... Well, have, what else needs to go into this? this? I need now. to get to the end so of this. We're at the end of this. So you have a scissors each. And what you should have is a little cup. So we might be... Yeah. So this is generally what's going to happen is you're going to excrete this out. So if you squeeze it into one corner... Oh, sorry, the last bit. I forgot the last bit. Sorry. Cotton wool. Cotton wool. We've got to put these in. So this is the last bit, your, your large intestine, which actually takes the moisture out. Okay. okay. So if you put so this, what makes it solid? Would, yeah. So this one. So we put them in, right. mix them around as well. This is the last bit. So as they go in through, so this will kind of take away some of the. Stomach. <laughs> right. So, so you're going to switch. Oh, so Lord. like a piping bag, you're making a cake. <laughs> Okay, so cut the corner. Oh, but I never made a cake that looks like this. So you're so squeeze. So oh, it there we go. Well, that is that. No, oh, like, I mean, go. well, it's, that would be, that's very, that would be it's sort of healthy. That would be healthy right. enough, would it? <laughs> Where am I to think of me poo? That's pretty good. There you go. Listen, Phil, yes. thank you so much for that. That You're was welcome. actually really interesting. I'd shake your hand, but it's uh, like yeah, right. in, no, yeah, in, uh, Listen, thank right. you very much for that. Miriam, <laughs> what's coming up on tomorrow? Show? I know we're close, but we're not that close, Alan. Coming up tomorrow, I'm going to be catching up with Brendan Gleeson. We're going to be talking movies uh, with Brian Lloyd. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye.